Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Okay, so if you listened to the first episode of this two-parter, you probably recall that the whole thing was downright soap opera-esque in many ways, and it is going to continue in a similar vein. So if you are listening with younger history buffs, be aware that there is a lot of talk of marital infidelity and children out of wedlock and just a lot of drama in terms of relationships. And a lot of this really becomes the tale of Lady Anne Blunt's husband because that really puts into pretty sharp focus the unhappy nature of her marriage and what she was enduring while simultaneously showing horses and running a successful horse breeding program and making a name for herself which he often took credit for. Um, So (laughs) we do highly recommend listening to the first part of this before you jump into this one, because we're kind of hopping in right where we left off. But for a very quick recap, we ended the last episode at something of a turning point in Lady Anne's life at the end of the 1870s. So at that point, she was over 40, uh, an age her mother told her she was never going to reach, so she felt this weird sense of liberation about it. She had also converted to Catholicism, something that her grandmother, Lady Byron, would never have approved of. So it also marks a break in her mentality in terms of doing what others thought of her. Um, And she had found what she felt was her calling as she traveled the Arabian desert, seeking out horses to combine with English thoroughbreds in her breeding program. And Anne's husband, Wilfred Blunt, after a very brief period in which he attempted to stop his adulterous habits, had gone right back to philandering. But though the marriage had problems, Anne and Wilfred's partnership breeding horses at Crabbit Farm as part of their Crabbit Stud program remained constant. And later, the couple's daughter, Judith, wrote that Anne was really the one with all of the knowledge about this breeding program and that she was basically succeeding despite her husband Wilfred's, quote, reckless disregard when it came to keeping and breeding horses. Yet Wilfred is the one with the historical marker. Oh, yes. He got credit for everything. And he was much more famous than his wife in their time and really even now. But Uh, As historians have examined their lives, it becomes really clear that she was doing all the heavy lifting and he was kind of showboating. So in late 1880, the Blunts traveled to Cairo. From there, they made their way first to the Red Sea coast and then back to Cairo in the following January. From there, they went into Syria. They went back to England after this with dozens of new horses. But at one point, Anne considered abandoning this work altogether She was really exhausted, both physically and mentally, from all the travel and from assessing and arranging the purchase of so many animals. Yeah, we mentioned in the last episode that, like, while she was taking care of these things and really keeping incredible records of all of the horses they had seen, like, Wilfred was doing some foolish things, like, I'm going to go hunt pigs and causing all kinds of problems. But as additional journeys into Egypt and Syria were scheduled— Anne felt more and more that where she wanted to be, for a while at least, was at the Crabbit Stud with their horses. She was increasingly unhappy at being away from them and from the program, but she went on these trips, although she noted in her diary that during this time she often felt ill while she was traveling. In early 1882, the Blunts purchased a 37-acre property outside of Cairo to open a stable there. And up until this point, they'd found themselves increasingly entangled in the politics that were leading up to the Anglo-Egyptian War. Wilfred and Anne often found themselves being just thrust into positions where they were seen as mediators among English, French, and Egyptian diplomats and leaders. The Blunts managed to weather all of this largely because they were wealthy and well-connected, but they went back to England in March of that year to, as the situation became more heated. Yeah, as you'll recall, uh, before he got married to Anne, Wilfred had worked for the Foreign Service, so it was not completely bizarre that they were turned to on occasion to help out in these discussions, but it wasn't something he was really necessarily super prepared for either. Uh, But once they got back to England, Wilfred continued to work on his diplomatic efforts, so much so that he decided that he needed to move out of the house and to an apartment in London so that he would not be interrupted by Anne or their daughter Judith. And while he had been seen by dignitaries in Egypt as a man of influence and import in England, back home, the staff at the Foreign Office kind of thought he was just meddling in diplomatic affairs. And to some, he was even regarded with suspicion. Like, they were like, why are you coming here and and trying to push this agenda? Like, 
Are you a spy of some sort? Similarly, he came to be seen eventually as a political pot stirrer in Egypt as things started to settle down, so much so that he was eventually banned from the country for three years. And Anne, who had also supported the cause of Egyptian nationalists, went back to work with the horses while that ongoing conflict and violence was playing out in Egypt. Lady Anne had continued to be loyal to Wilfred in spite of his behavior, but he finally pushed things too far, and it was far enough that Anne said something about it. He had been having an affair with Lady Augusta Gregory. The two of them had met in Egypt, and they'd bonded over their shared dismay over the way that the British Empire was handling things in Egypt. For context, Lady Gregory, who would make a great show topic one day, founded the Irish Literary Theater and the Abbey Theater later in her life. She did that with William Butler Yeats and Edward Martin. Yeah, Lady Anne and Wilfred Blunt, uh, their lives bump up against all kinds of famous figures uh, in England at the time. Like, they knew Oscar Wilde. They were friends with um, Gertrude Bell. Like, there are a lot of people that interact. But because he had an affair with... um, Lady Gregory, I wanted to make sure we gave some clarification on who she was. And Anne had been supportive and tolerant of Wilfred's work as essentially a volunteer statesman at this point. She had made space for him to do so and had left him to his own devices. So he was paying no attention to her or their daughter, but she was like, it's okay, you're working. But in return for all of this kindness and making these allowances, Wilfred openly declared his love for another woman, Lady Gregory. And though Wilfred decided to dial back the relationship with Lady Gregory in order to concentrate on his work, after he did, he behaved almost as though he had been jilted himself. His temper was short, he sulked, he basically was insufferable. And Anne had turned a blind eye to his philandering throughout their marriage, but he claimed to love this woman, which to her was a different matter, and it wounded her very deeply. This was when Lady Anne really reached the point that enough was enough. And to make that clear, on August 10th, 1883, she wrote a lengthy letter to her husband. She detailed how much pain that he had caused her and how she had realized that what she thought she had was all a lie. She wrote, quote, It is too late. I accept the truth, preferring it to a false dream. She wrote all of her feelings out on two pages of fool's cap, and that's a paper size that's similar to a legal pad, She handed this letter over to Wilfred, but she didn't speak to him on the matter again, and she didn't change her behavior with him. Later on, as Wilfred continued his various affairs, including with Lady Gregory, Anne wrote, quote, I don't agree to Lady G having all the rose leaves while the thorns are kept for me. Yeah, it was interesting. She um, she was not an emotionally super demonstrative person. Uh, she was very even keel. And we even talked about in the first part of this two-parter, like when she talked about her wedding day and wrote it down in her journal, it was pretty dispassionate and more like a, a, a catalog of the day's events. So it was kind of a big deal that she had written this letter so passionately, even though she just handed it to her husband and did not engage in like a verbal sparring with him at that point. That was a pretty big statement for her. It is unclear when Wilfred Blunt wrote his reply to that letter. Although it is not actually a direct reply to her, it's more of a commentary on her letter. And it seems to have happened sometime between 1883 and 1886. But again, because of the way um, it's mentioned in their diaries, it's not clear when it actually happened. But in that letter that he wrote, he confessed his infidelity, but he also managed to take little to no responsibility for the problems in their marriage. Writing, quote, In the long history of my vagrant heart, I have said little of what was my conjugal life at home. This, in spite of my many lapses, had in reality been quite a happy one. Though I have loved other women, I have not, for that reason, been less kind to my wife. Nor has she had cause to reproach me with the neglect of those duties for which matrimony was primarily ordained. No one, in truth, ever had a stronger desire for the procreation of children, and yet we had no heir." Now, however, the day of such hopes was fairly at an end. I was 42 and 45, and with the vanishing of what we have so long desired in common, a certain estrangement had begun between us, for which I do not, in my conscience, think I was seriously to blame. Nevertheless, the gradual separation was in secret making her unhappy. My infidelity she had condoned as due to my poet's nature, but my inconstancy, for she so deemed it, filled her with despair. 
It did not continue thus to love her. It was proof that I had never loved her truly. So in case you missed it, he blames her for not having a son. (laughs) And that that's the reason that, of course, once we couldn't have kids anymore, really, of course I wanted to see other women, even though he was seeing them while they were trying for children. Uh, And none of it's his fault. (laughs) And she said he could cheat, even though she never really had. Uh, I'm not Wilfred's biggest fan. I'll be very frank about it. Well, and in case... In case folks have forgotten from part one, while they were having trying to have children, she had a series of complications and miscarriages and and premature births, and the whole thing was, I mean, it was a big deal. Yeah. So, for that to be the thing that he's sort of pinning the blame on is particularly frustrating. Yeah, it's definitely like the the writing of someone who is super self involved and cannot see how their actions have any uh, impact on other people or that their actions could in any way be judged wrong. So once again, in all of this, Anne found solace in her work with horses and her ongoing lessons in Arabic language. They traveled again in 1883 and eventually made their way to India that November. During the trip, Anne's journals really reflected her ongoing animosity toward her husband, When Wilfred was sick in Bombay, she wrote, Wilfred begins again to look much worn and tired, and yet he is too independent of any sympathy from me to care about having it, so that I shall no longer venture to make even the smallest advance. Yeah, they kind of got in this habit where they would travel uh, eastward during the winters and then go back to England during the the spring and summer. And so this cycle continued over and over. But we're going to pick up with Anne and Wilfred's life once they traveled back home after this first trip, after they had had that sort of quiet blowout about his affair with Lady Gregory. Uh, But first, we are going to pause and have a little sponsor break. So later, after the couple had returned to England, Anne continued to feel lonely and isolated, and she wrote about having to one day explain the enmity of their household to their daughter, Judith. But even as the pair seemed to be emotionally completely separated, they did stay married, and Anne supported Wilfred as he pursued various political positions and causes. In the 1870s, he had a son out of wedlock with a woman named Mrs. Georgie Sumner, and Anne's money, her inheritance, paid for that boy's schooling. After the fallout from Wilfred's love of Lady Gregory and his ongoing efforts in politics, he turned his attention entirely to Ireland, hence he started lobbying for Irish home rule. He decided to travel to Ireland alone in 1886 and wrote in his journal at the time that he had only enemies and that no one loved him despite his efforts to be a just and loving man himself. (laughs) Uh, Again, it's the same thing, right, where he can't, see how his behaviors are causing his problems. Uh, The family, though, including Judith, did all group back together, and they traveled to Rome for Christmas in 1886, and then they moved on to Egypt from there. They had gotten special permission that Wilfred could return, although that permission was granted with some trepidation and with things being made very clear that, like, hey, we told you you could not come back to this country. Behave yourself. Uh, So they got to spend time at their stables there and have what seemed to actually be a pretty restful stay for several months and something close to an amicable peace between the spouses. But Blunt's involvement in Irish politics brought more strife into the family after they returned home from Egypt. In October 1887, Wilfred led a tenant protest outside of Galway when word circulated that the owner of the land was planning to evict everyone. He was arrested. He wound up spending two months in jail, which was something that he took as a source of pride. He claimed to be the only Englishman to take up the cause of Ireland. Similarly to how things played out regarding his role in Egypt, he came to be seen as more of a rabble-rouser than a true leader, and he let that feed his ego. Once he was released and the dust had settled, he declared it the end of his political career and turned to poetry as his primary outlet. Yeah, he was definitely very prolific later in his life in terms of writing uh, once he decided that politics were not for him anymore. Lady Anne, Wilfred, and Judith, who had reached an age where she was easier to travel with, 
uh, continued to travel frequently. They continued that cycle that I spoke about where they would travel to the east in the winters and back in the, the spring and summer. And Judith, in her teenage years, started to see more and more clearly the very, very poor marriage that her parents shared. She actually once told Anne that she feared being treated by a husband the way that her father treated Anne. And that really terrified and upset Anne, so much so that she wrote later in her journal that one must try to bury such thoughts or be mortally wounded by them. While she endured Wilfred's ongoing womanizing and foolishness, which even if we just listed the names of all the women he was involved with could fill an hour of audio, she wasn't idle. She was, as we mentioned just a few moments ago, continuing to study Arabic, and she became fluent enough that she was able to start working on translation projects. She published the first of her translated works, The Stealing of the Mayor, in 1892. This is also sometimes seen as the celebrated romance of The Stealing of the Mayor, and it was originally written in the 11th century. And this project actually offered up another potential avenue for Anne and Wilfred to combine their efforts Uh, similar to the way that horse breeding kind of stayed a thing that drew them together. So she had translated all of the work, and then he had worked her translation into verse, which sounds pretty cool, although it was not a great translation. Her translation was very, very um, literal, kind of word for word, so it, it lost a little bit of the nuance of the original writing. And then because of the way Wilfred was taking that kind of direct translation and making it into verse, the whole thing ended up a little bit stilted. It didn't get sort of rave reviews as being a great English translation of this work of Arabic culture. In the meantime, they were starting to have some serious issues with money. While Anne had researched horse breeding extensively and managed that aspect of the Crabbit stud, Wilfred had been in charge of the administrative side of the business, and he had really made a mess of things. He also overspent personally, and things became so concerning that Anne had to reassure her brother Ralph that her inheritance wasn't going to be used to cover their business costs. Yeah, people started to realize that Wilfred was just being super irresponsible with money, and they were like, hey, you know, this this inheritance of yours is intended to to be your personal, like what keeps you personally afloat. Please don't let him siphon off everything from you to fix his problems in business. And Blunt, at this point, had also grown more forward with his womanizing. It was kind of like once that Lady Gregory situation was out in the open, he just stopped trying to be subtle at all. And in 1895, he invited Lady Mary Elko to visit their property in Egypt while he, Anne, and Judith were there. The intent was that he was going to seduce her. And this was not just his usual philandering, though. His political rival in Ireland, Arthur Balfour, had also been interested in Mary. And while Wilfred was legitimately interested in her, there was definitely an element of revenge about this whole situation. Wilfred called Mary his Bedouin wife, and during this time she became pregnant. Mary's husband, Hugo, showed up in the desert and joined this party, and Wilfred had a fit of jealousy Hugo and Mary had what seemed to be kind of an open marriage, so there wasn't a lot of concern from their parts about the affair. But a child who had been fathered by Wilfred Blunt, which was the only possible father based on the timing, was going to be really problematic for the family's inheritance, and it was just going to cause a huge scandal. When the Blunts returned home to England, both Mary and her husband had written Wilfred letters chastising him for having ruined Mary's life. Wilfred coped with all of this by telling his teenage daughter everything uh, for reasons that do not make sense to me. Uh, And then he kind of ran away for an extended trip. He traveled around Europe. And to further complicate matters, he had also seduced one of Judith's best friends. So again, one of his daughter's best friends. And then when that young woman got married, he talked to Judith about have, feeling as though he had been abandoned, even though Judith was also sad because she realized she wasn't going to get to spend time with her best friend anymore. When Judith finally confronted him about his behavior with her closest friend, he then threatened to marry his daughter off to whomever he chose. Fortunately, though she had remained in the marriage throughout all of this and had realized that she could not trust or count on her husband, While she may have felt unable to make a move against him for all of these infidelities, when he put the breeding program in jeopardy with his poor money management, she decided to take matters into her own hands. 
She started breeding some of her horses at locations that were away from Crabbit, and she kept those locations so secret that she wouldn't even put them in her diary. Only she and Judith knew where she was doing this. She also started making business arrangements to acquire new stock with her own money without her husband's involvement. As the blunts reached the end of the 19th century, the various indiscretions which had caused scandals and drama seemed to become less of an issue. As time had passed, people just were less up in arms about any of it. And Wilfred actually began socializing with the same people who had treated him as a pariah just a few years before, including Mary Elko, the woman he had gotten pregnant, and all of her friends. Anne became even more devoted to her horses, and she was said to sleep in her riding habit so that she could jump out of bed and run out to be with them first thing. She also allegedly started calling the veterinarian for her own illnesses as well as those of her animals. Wilfred was ill and had been for a number of years, starting with digestive issues and progressing to a point where he was taking morphine as a pain reliever. Yeah, they were both getting up in age at this point, keep in mind. So, uh, you know, many various things were happening. It is a little weird and eccentric that she stopped calling human doctors and wanted to see veterinary doctors for herself. Um, But we're going to talk more about their daughter, Judith, and her life as an adult in just a moment. But first, we have to have a little moment uh, and hear from one of the sponsors that keeps this show going. So, Wilfred sort of pushed their 26-year-old daughter, Judith, into marriage. She had had many young men interested in her over the years, but she had been proposed to by family friend Neville Lytton, six years her junior, and while she was considering the proposal, Wilfred kind of jumped the gun, and he went ahead and posted an engagement announcement in the papers. Judith did not dislike Neville, but she also didn't feel ready for marriage, and she was really terrified at the thought of conceiving and bearing children. Uh, But just the same, she accepted the fate that had spooled out before her due to her father's rash behavior. And the wedding, with the agreement of both families, was in Cairo, but Wilfred opted out of attending, citing his poor health as the reason, and Anne wrote him a very detailed account of the entire day. Despite just an increasing list of medical issues, Wilfred managed to continue to stir up trouble, both politically and at home. When Anne got home from a stay in Egypt after looking after the stables there and dealing with some of the business decisions that he had made, she found out that he had made an entirely new mess in England. He had sold off some of their land and horses and had allowed other land to become marshy. Yeah, he had this weird idea that he was going to let the land go back to nature, and so he canceled this carefully laid out drainage program that they had, and... Oh, Wilfred. Um, The Blunts finally separated in 1906. So Anne had stayed with him for years, knowing he had never been faithful, and that he had had children with other women, and that he had caused some business problems. But in 1906, the final straw came when Wilfred just openly moved his mistress at the time, Dorothy Carlton, into the home that they shared. And additionally, stirred up by this idea that maybe they were going to separate, the couple began to argue over the future of the stud that they had built together and how they might proceed in separating it. Uh, The main biography that I read actually kind of hinted that less so than Dorothy Carlton, the way he wanted to handle the stud going forward was what really just kind of made Lady Anne say, like, I am so done with you. Yeah, she eventually had to agree to Wilfred's desire to split their assets, although he also believed that in doing so, she would owe him money, and that made her really furious. She had pitched the idea of just turning over the Crabbit stud to Judith, but Wilfred was not open to that idea. Eventually, she got everything legally settled, she made sure all the servants were paid, she stocked the pantry, and she left to move in with Judith and her family. Judith eventually left her mother in their cottage to move to Crabbit and tend to the breeding business herself full-time. And for what it's worth, uh, Wilfred continued to be embroiled in drama because he cheated on Dorothy Carlton with many of the same paramours he had kept throughout his life. So this was clearly not a matter of him and Anne being poorly matched. It was just who he was. Lady Anne got in the habit of wintering in Egypt at the breeding farm there and then traveling back to Crabbit Park in the summers to visit Judith and Neville and her grandchildren. 
she and Wilfred eventually reached a point that they could visit with one another in about 1915, but the family seemed doomed to always have conflict. Various other issues rose up between Judith and Wilfred and then Judith and Anne. Wilfred became addicted to morphine, and after he and Judith had a massive argument in front of Judith's children, he was no longer allowed to see his grandchildren. In the fall of 1915, Lady Anne decided to move to Egypt full-time. The Crabbit Park facility continued to operate under the stewardship of Judith, although it still had financial struggles. And for her part, Anne described herself as quite happy in the desert, although she was anxious about a variety of things, including things like finances and her family. She seemed to think she was in a much poorer state than she actually was. She didn't have a full sense of what her financial value actually was. In November of 1917, a letter from Egypt made its way to Anne's relatives and relayed the news that Anne was very ill with dysentery. Anne had also had a skin condition that had been disfiguring, and she didn't want her family to make the journey to see her. She died in a Cairo hospital on December 15, 1917. Wilfred designed the headstone for her grave in Egypt, which read, Here lies in the Egyptian desert, which she loved, Lady Anne Blunt. Lady Anne left Wilfred her notes and books on horse breeding, but nothing else. Judith received a manuscript that Anne had been working on, and Anne left her little else because she felt that she was pretty properly squared away financially. Like, the family money was passing to her, uh, and she was married. And she left all of her major assets, including the land in Egypt, to trustees to hold for her grandchildren, specifically her granddaughters, because they were not inheriting the titles that her grandson was. Wilfred and Judith ended up mired in a legal battle over the assets that the trustees had taken possession of. The horses, which were widely recognized for their value, had been seized by Blunt, but Judith and her children took them from his property. They moved him back to Crabbit. Simultaneously, other breeders were trying to make offers on all the stock, but the question of ownership made the whole situation a big mess. After a legal battle, Wilfred Blunt lost the horses to his daughter. That was something of a shock to him, I think. He really thought, like, I helped put this whole thing together. They were my wife's horses, so they should be my horses. He was a little surprised. But uh, he actually died not that long after all of this, on September 10th, 1922. Judith Blunt Lytton divorced from Neville in 1920, but she devoted her life to continuing her mother's work. She maintained the Crabbit bloodlines for years, She finished her mother's book, titled The Authentic Arabian Horse, in 1945. That had been Anne's greatest project, and it was the manuscript that had been left to Judith in the will. And today, an estimated 90% of Arabian horses in the world can trace at least one of their bloodlines back to the Crabbit stock. And that is all thanks to the work of Lady Anne Blunt and her daughter Judith. Do you have some listener mail for us? I do, and it's not so dramatic. Like, the whole time I was uh, reading... Her biography and a biography on Wilfred, I just (laughs) kept marveling at how dramatic all of it was, particularly the fact that so many of these marriages, uh, I mean, I understood all for a long time that a lot of marriages at that level of society are kind of arranged for financial benefit and for positioning, but they really were just so casually like, oh, you should go stay with your mistress while she's sick, and we'll hook back up later, and you, ch- I'm going to go see this person, and the the nature of it is so very soap opera-y that it was just startling to me, that it was not necessarily like one or two here and there, pretty common. Uh, My listener mail, however, is delightful. It is brief because this episode ran a little long. It is about the Georgia Gold Rush, and it is sent from our listener Paige. Paige writes, Holly and Tracy, thank you for the episode on the Georgia Gold Rush. My mother's family has lived in Hall County, Georgia, since 1832, when an ancestor won a parcel in the land lottery. Unfortunately, my ancestors also played a part in the removal of the Cherokee. I have taken a field trip to a gold mine and honestly cannot recommend going out of your way to visit Dahlonega. No shade to Dahlonega. I'm sure it's lovely. I know lots of friends that think it's darling. Uh, But I loved hearing a mention of our little town, Gainesville, originally called Mule Camp Springs. Uh, Love you, ladies. Keep spreading knowledge. That's very cool. Um, The the idea, I mean, it's not cool what happened to the Cherokee, but it's uh, cool that you can so readily trace your family's history back to an event the first gold rush in the United States. Uh, If you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com. 
We are also all over social media as Missed in History. You can find us at mistinhistory.com where there are uh, all the episodes of the show that have ever existed, including show notes on the ones that Tracy and I have worked on. And we hope that you come and visit us at mistinhistory.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com. 